Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Sophie Hayes and I'm the nurse at Integro Medical Clinics. Uh, I'm also the clinical lead of CPAS's Nurses Arm. And I'm here to welcome you to this collaborative webinar discussing cannabis medicines for fibromyalgia and arthritis. We are very fortunate that this webinar is brought to you by multiple collaborating organizations in the UK medical cannabis space. Uh, we have UK Fibromyalgia, which is an organization, uh, also, excuse me, organization that seeks to help the fibromyalgia community by publishing a monthly magazine newsletter and running various social media campaigns to provide those in need with the advice and increase awareness that they need. Uh, we have the Primary Care Cannabis Network, which is an organization specifically designed to support GPs and their patients' needs. Uh, they're collaborating on this event as they believe through shared experience and learning more about balanced opinions of cannabis medicines uh, will help us move forward. Uh, we've got Cannabis Patient and Advocacy Support Services, so CPAS, which is a non-profit organization providing education, advocacy, and support for patients and healthcare professionals with a particular focus on nurses, um, considering cannabis-based medicines for their patients, and patient-led engagement for access, or PLEA, a proud volunteer-led non-profit community interest company established to challenge the inequalities to cannabis medicinal products in the UK, who are celebrating Medical Cannabis Awareness Week this week with multiple events examining the progression of cannabis medicine in the UK. And finally, Integro Medical Clinics, which is one of the few private clinics able to prescribe cannabis medicines in the UK. Our expert team of doctors value their patients and provide gold standard medical care in this emerging field of medicine. Uh, if you would like to get in contact with the team at Integro, uh, there will be, the details will be provided at the end of the webinar. Um, if you're interested in, in exploring any of the organizations that I've mentioned further, there will be an email going out at the end of this webinar with all the information, all of their websites, so you can go and have a look your, for yourself. So this is going to be the first of two education sessions. One of which, This one will be focusing on practical application of the biomedical knowledge behind cannabis medicines and fibromyalgia and arthritis. Uh, and the discussion will explore both the pharmacology and the potential benefits, including cannabis medicines in chronic pain management regimes for these patient groups. Uh, the healthcare professionals taking part in the event have years of experience between them in cannabis pharmacology, complex pain management, and expertise in the treatment and management of fibromyalgia and arthritis. So it is my personal pleasure to introduce our speakers this evening, both of whom have been a huge influence on my practice and learning in this field. So here we will start with Dr. Ethan Russo, uh, who is a board certified neurologist, psychopharmacology researcher, and founder, CEO of Credo, or excuse me if I've misrepresented that or mispronounced that, science. Uh, was previously was director of research and development for the International Cannabis and Cannabinoids Institute, medical director of Phytex, and from 2003 to 2014, senior medical advisor, medical monitor study physician to GW Pharmaceuticals for their clinical trials of Sativex and Epidiolex. He's a clinical neurologist in Missoula, Montana for 20 years, and has held faculty appointments in pharmaceutical sciences at the University of Montana and in medicine at the University of Washington. He is the author and editor of seven books and has published more than 50 peer-reviewed articles. Dr. Anthony Ordman is the founder of the highly respected chronic pain clinic at London's Royal Free Hospital. He is one of the UK's most experienced specialists in the treatment of pain. For his contributions to pain medicine, Dr. Aldman was awarded fellowship of the Royal College of Physicians in 2005, and he is immediate past president of the pain medicine section of the Royal Society of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Aldman is also senior clinician and lead consultant at Integro Medical Clinics, and has special interest in the potential of benefits of cannabis medicines in the area of pain. So it is a real privilege to be on the teaching section such as this one with such accomplished individuals. So thank you both of you for joining us and thank you guys for this joining us as well this evening. I will be monitoring the chat during the presentations. If you would like to ask one of our panelists a question, please put it in the chat and I will accumulate them at the end and I'll be moderating a question and answer, answer session after both the teaching sessions have been over. Um, so we're going to start after everything, uh, with a presentation from Dr. Russo on the pharmacology behind how cannabis medicines affect fibromyalgia in particular. Uh, Dr. Russo, if you're ready. Yes, I am. So first I'd like to share the screen. I would like to thank Sophie and all the sponsors uh, for organizing this. Um, I'm coming to you from the West Coast of the United States, the Pacific Northwest. This is my email address. 
Um, additionally, uh, there is ethanrusso.org. Uh, there's actually an article based on some of the, uh, well, there will be an article. I, I'm sorry, let me back up. So let's proceed. We're talking, of course, about fibromyalgia, cannabis, and the endocannabinoid system. And that didn't advance, so I'm going to do it otherwise. Now, we'll start off with this great British doctor, Sir William Gowers, uh, who first described what we recognize today as fibromyalgia as fibrositis in 1904. Uh, it's estimated to affect between 2 and 8% of the population worldwide, and uh, there are at least 10 million patients in the U.S. Um, it's thought that uh, where cannabis is available in countries around the world might comprise 22 million people with fibromyalgia. So this is still a controversial diagnosis. I remember one of my British colleagues when I recommended that we investigate Sativex for fibromyalgia uh, was still skeptic skeptical about the existence of the diagnosis. It is the most frequent diagnosis by American rheumatologists, and of course encompasses a syndrome with diffuse pain in the body, sleep disturbance and mood disturbance, which is secondary, not primary. Um, this has been commonly portrayed as a central sensitization syndrome, meaning that the sensory nerves are hyped up and seemingly over respond uh, to stimuli. This also produces what's called a secondary hyperalgesia, an excess of pain in areas uh, that seemingly might not even being, be affected, uh, but have a lowered threshold uh, for uh, developing pain. Um, this was felt by authors in Italy to affect the N-methyl diaspartate uh, receptor system and blockade there uh, seems to counteract a defect in serotonergic analgesia, uh, pain killing. Hyperalgesia, this excess of pain is related to a central endocannabinoid hypofunction. Endocannabinoids are endogenous chemicals that resemble THC in their effects. The endocannabinoids at the spinal level, if they're administered, reduce this hyperalgesia and that suggests the rationale for treatment of disorders like fibromyalgia uh, that have this sensitization. And this includes other things uh, like migraine um, and uh, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, reflex sympathetic dystrophy, uh, complex regional pain disorder. Uh, it's also noted that cannabis is frequently employed by patients with the disorder, and we'll talk more about that soon. Um, in 2001, I developed a theory that I called clinical endocannabinoid deficiency and wrote about it then with two subsequent articles in 2004 and 2016. The idea behind it, the hypothesis is that we all have an underlying endocannabinoid tone. That's a reflection of the levels of the endocannabinoids, anandamide and 2-arachidonoglycerol are the best characterized, how they're produced, whether they're broken down, and what's the state of the cannabinoid receptors where they lodge and where THC lodges. So the theory uh, posited that under certain conditions, whether you were born this way or acquired the disorder, endocannabinoid tone gets lowered. And this produces certain disorders, uh, including fibromyalgia. So uh, the first long article I wrote about this was in 2004, and I really, uh, for clinical endocannabinoid deficiency, was focusing on migraine, fibromyalgia, and irritable bowel syndrome. But as you see, there were a bunch of other disorders, some of which also have proven to have evidence behind them uh, beyond the theory at that time. Interestingly, fibromyalgia, migraine, and irritable bowel syndrome are what are called comorbid disorders. They're all hyperalgesic. There seems to be an overreaction to pain. They're all clinical diagnoses. None have a particular lab test. Uh, and there's no identifiable pathology of the tissue uh, 
So it, it's based on a pattern of activity. Now, these seem to occur in the same individuals, unfortunately. When someone has a primary headache disorder, um, uh, there was a primary headache disorder that was identified in 97% of fibromyalgia patients uh, in Italy. Uh, and then for people who have chronic daily headache, a form of migraine, um, a third of them plus had fibromyalgia. Likewise, um, over 30% of irritable bowel subjects had fibromyalgia and 32% of the FM patients had irritable bowel. So these are quite related. Unfortunately, if a person comes to the clinic with all three of these, it's likely that her male doctor is going to label her as hypochondriacal or having a somatization disorder. And in fact, all of these have a biochemical basis. Um, let's turn to some studies. This one was done in Germany and it was an uncontrolled study, oddly, the uh, ethics committee there said that they could give THC even in high doses up to 15 milligrams a day over three months, but they wouldn't let them use a, a placebo. Now they actually were trying to get everyone to the 15 milligrams a day, and that's too much for many people. So five of the nine dropped out due to adverse events. But for the four subjects who completed the study, um, there was no change in their allodynia. Uh, this is the feeling of pain on touch uh, or pinpricked induced hyperalgesia, uh, but there were prominent reductions in perceived pain. So this is based on their subjective assessment. So if we looked at that graphically, uh, it would be statistically significant if we cheat and ignore the fact that there wasn't a placebo. A study that was done in Canada looked at nabilone. Nabilone is a semi-synthetic analog of THC. Uh, it's about 10 times more potent. So they looked at 40 fibromyalgia patients using nabilone one milligram BID, which would be equivalent again to a high dose of, of THC, 20 milligrams. After four weeks, there were statistically significant improvements over placebo for pain the fibromyalgia impact questionnaire and anxiety. And you can see that in graphic form. Uh, also in Canada, my friend Mark Ware um, looked at nabilone again, uh, just on sleep and fibromyalgia, comparing it to amitriptyline. Um, the doses were uh, 0.5 to one milligram of nabilone compared to 10 to 20 milligrams of amitriptyline. Um, nabilone was superior to amitriptyline in, for sleep. Uh, however, th there were no effects noted in this study on pain, mood, or quality of life. Uh, so it makes one question. Nabilone is quite different to cannabis, I would point out. Um, again, about 10 times more potent than THC. This was an acute study that was done um, in Barcelona looking at 28 patients who uh, smoke cannabis compared to 28 controls. After two hours, the visual analog scale uh, scores showed a reduction of pain and stiffness, increased relaxation, increase in, in sleepiness on a feeling of well-being. Um, the mental health component summary score was also um, higher in cannabis users than non-users. However, it, it, this was an acute setting. Really what we need is evidence of long-term benefit uh, to be more convincing. Um, the most interesting study to me is actually this survey that was done in the US and by the National Pain Report. Over 1,300 fibromyalgia patients were queried as to the reactions to the Food and Drug Administration approved drugs, which are duloxetine, milnasopran, and pregabalin, uh, as compared to cannabis. Now, you'll note that not everyone used all these, but these are the numbers who did, and their reactions um, from very effective uh, to doesn't help at all. Now, the strange thing here is that the regulatory approved drugs 
were perceived by the vast majority to not help at all as compared to the people who use cannabis found it very effective. Um, so there's a real mismatch here and uh, should indicate the need for good uh, randomized controlled trials of the uh, properly constituted cannabis-based medicine. So now we're going to turn to a study um, that uh, is almost finished. Um, we have some things to report. Um, I, again, had a theory uh, that perhaps fibromyalgia might be due to an autoimmune disorder affecting the CB1 or, and or CB2 receptors. We know that there are various autoimmune diseases that affect neurotransmitter receptors, most notably the acetylcholine receptor in myasthenia gravis, and then the NMDA receptor in the brain in what's called anti-NMDA receptor antibody encephalitis. That was the subject of a bestseller book uh, that we see here. I wondered, could a similar phenomenon affect CB1 and or CB2 in fibromyalgia? Uh, if so, this might explain the chronic pain, hyperalgesia, sleep disturbance, anxiety, and depression. Uh, all of which we know are mediated by the endocannabinoid system. So what we did, uh, and this was funded by Credo Science, my company, uh, independently, we had no grants. We looked at 200 subjects, 100 with fibromyalgia and 100 controls. Um, and we had very strict inclusion and exclusion criteria uh, they couldn't have other autoimmune disorders. They couldn't be on immunosuppressive drugs, et cetera, as you see here. Um, each person was put through the American College of Rheumatology uh, criteria. Uh, I believe this is the, the 2010 revision. Um, so uh, to get in, you had to pass this uh, and not have the exclusions. Uh, to be a control, you had to not have fibromyalgia. So on the first page, uh, this outlines areas of pain in the prior week, and those are totaled uh, to create a score. And the next page uh, includes rating severity of fatigue, sleep disturbance, and cognitive symptoms, and quantifying other symptoms. Um, and these other symptoms you can see here, I hope it's a little blurry, but it includes all kinds of stuff. Um, and to get a score on the ACR, uh, you sum the widespread pain index score and the symptom severity score. And then if they meet these criteria, WPI greater than seven and NASS greater than five, or the WPI is three to six and NASS is greater than nine with symptoms for greater than five, three months and no other conditions explain it, then you have fibromyalgia. So a little complicated, but um, the score sheets make it a little easier. So the idea was to take serum from both the patients who had 100 patients who had fibromyalgia and 100 patients who did not, and compare them to look for what are called autoantibodies, antibodies that would develop putatively to the CB1 receptor. And this is being undertaken by uh, Dr. Ken Mackey. Um, now, if we found this, a positive result would demonstrate that fibromyalgia is a biochemically induced disorder. And for the first time, there might be an objective laboratory test that could evaluate the condition and maybe save some money on scans and other um, diagnostics that have been unrewarding in the past. Um, you know, superfluous diagnostic tests. Uh, also, if this were proven, it uh, would provide a rationale for cannabis-based treatment of fibromyalgia symptoms that we know uh, work, um, and also the possibility of immunomodulation uh, with cannabidiol and tetrahydrocannabinolic acid, and also raise the possibility of developing a biological. So this would be anti-autoantibody anti agents, creating an antibody that would knock out the uh, disease-causing issue. 
Now, this idea was supported by a recent article, and this was long after we began our study, um, but Goebel et al. Um, looked at immunoglobulin G uh, that was taken from eight fibromyalgia patients. Um, and they injected this into mice and produced a mechanical hypersensitivity reminiscent of fibromyalgia. And seven of eight of uh, the sera produced uh, sensitivity to cold. Um, it also decreased the uh, mouse grip strength. Um, and then um, the nociceptors, the nerves that carry pain, uh, produce reduced force and mechanical stimulation. So it showed that there's a transferable factor and it certainly could be an antibody. Um, sorry about that. So here's where the story gets a little tricky. Um, Dr. Mackey had initially reported to me that after doing many of the patients, but not all, that they did not find the uh, autoantibodies to the CB1 receptor. However, they did find something else. And this is where I point out that often in medicine, one sets out with a certain idea in mind and then serendipitously important uh, discoveries are made. We hope that we're on the threshold of one of those discoveries, but I'm not able to give you the final answer yet because we don't have it, but we are working on that and uh, hope to have more information that we can share soon. Uh, and I'd like to close with this, um, quoting myself from the 2004 article. Um, this is in relation to cannabis, uh, thinking of using it uh, to treat clinical endocannabinoid deficiency, including FM. Only time and the scientific method will ascertain whether a new paradigm is applicable to human physiology and treatment of its derangements. Our insight into these possibilities is dependent on the contribution of one unique healing plant, for a clinical cannabis has become a therapeutic compass to what modern medicine fails to cure. And with that, I thank you for your attention and we'll stop sharing to yield the floor. No, thank you uh, very much. That was excellent. Thank you. Um, if it's okay with you that we will probably be moving on to Dr. Orman's presentation and then we can do questions at the end because they're coming through very quickly. So I want to make sure we get to them. Um, so um, I'm going to present Dr. Orman's presentation, which is going to be on the sort of current management strategies for fibromyalgia in UK medicine uh, and his findings regarding cannabis medicines in practice here in the UK. So Dr. Oldman, if you're ready to share your slides. So Sophie and all of the organisers, thank you so very much for inviting me to speak uh, this evening. Um, it's a particular honour and a particular challenge to follow Dr. Ethan Russo, who's actually become uh, my great hero in, uh, since I've been involved in cannabis medicines and whose um, concept of uh, clinical endocannabinoid deficiency has been an extremely helpful one in, in, in thinking about how we try to help many of our patients and indeed explaining to them what it is that we're trying to do with cannabis-based medicines. So uh, thank you very much. So <clears throat> inevitably after hearing the master speak, this is going to be very much a personal view from here in, in, in the UK, from somebody who spent most of his career being a conventional medicine pain doctor and, and is now really finding out all sorts of new ways of doing things with cannabis medicines. So we're talking about fibromyalgia, also known as fibromyalgia syndrome, and increasingly amongst my colleagues, this has been called chronic widespread pain as well, or chronic widespread primary pain sometimes. Um, and as we've heard, it's, it's characterized by widespread musculoskeletal pain, which patients actually often tell you is coming from their joints, which is interesting. Whether it is or not, I don't know, but I suspect that's because that's where the muscles tend to join on around the joints. And it really feels as though to them that often intense pain is coming from the joints themselves. 
when I examine these people, and I'm quite old fashioned as a doctor, I like to examine people with my hands. These are often quite powerful diagnostic tools. Patients like it when you examine them because they feel you're being a, a proper doctor. But often you can tell an awful lot from feeling the muscles and the nerves and the tissues, which really you cannot tell from blood tests or MRI scans or things like that. And I, I can often feel the really painful and very tight muscles running throughout the body. When I press on them, people say, oh, yes, that's it, that's it, that's it. And they like it. Um, and in a minute, I'll show you where I'm pressing. Dr. Russo ma mentioned allodynia. Allodynia is a phenomenon where gentle or light touch usually is experienced by the patient as unpleasant or painful. And that's a very important sign in long-term pain states. I'll come back to that in a minute. So often the patient with fibromyalgia is also exhausted. They're plagued by chronic fatigue and they're plagued by brain fog. They just can't remember anything and uh, can't concentrate or focus on anything. And that is a huge difficulty for people who are trying to get on with their lives. Often they tell you that they sleep maybe for eight hours or whatever, but when they wake up, they're just as exhausted and unrefreshed as when they went to sleep, which is also dreadful. And so understandably, they have low mood and, and, and just feel dreadful, often very anxious. And then fibromyalgia is often associated with irritable bowel syndrome, migraines or chronic headaches, as we've heard, often tension headaches where all the muscles at the back of the neck are tight and painful. And then one of those other mystery um, long-term pain problems, temporomandibular joint pain, the little joint between the jaw and the skull just in front of the ear there, which can become very, very painful, often again in people who are chronically stressed um, or who are finding life very difficult. And so people with fibromyalgia have great physical and psychological difficulties. There's huge impacts on their lives. And the prevalence varies on the study and the population being studied. But, you know, even 3% of a huge population, as in Brazil, is uh, a huge number of people. Women are very many, uh, much more likely to, to be the fibromyalgia patients than men, but not exclusively so. And we could speculate on the reasons for that. In Israel, uh, another population that's been studied, the prevalence is as high as 8% of the population. And often uh, symptoms come on uh, after a specific event or physical trauma or a car crash or surgery or an infection of various sorts. Um, uh, and always, almost always psychological stress is a feature. In other cases, it's not obvious uh, at first to, to, to understand what has triggered this event. Maybe it is indeed an autoimmune event. We don't know. Can you diagnose this with blood tests? Well, not really. I don't personally know of any blood tests that will help us diagnose fibromyalgia. So if we do do blood tests, it's more to exclude other conditions such as uh, rheumatology, inflammatory conditions such as lupus or polymyalgia rheumatica or primary muscle conditions. Um, and then other similar conditions where there's changes in the neural processing of pain um, include Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, part of the hypermobility uh, complex, which we're gradually learning about. And the other thing which gives you unrefreshing sleep and indeed muscle tension is obstructive sleep apnea, which in our increasingly affluent and sometimes obese population, but often slim people get this as well. People are just being woken up every few minutes by um, extreme snoring that blocks their breathing altogether. And they never really get into deep sleep and have a good, good night's sleep. So how do you diagnose fibromyalgia? Well, trying to be objective, the rheumatologist, I think it was the American rheumatologist, 
um, said, well, look, you've got to look for these muscle tender points. And, and, and um, if you've, I think if you've got more than four of these, then this is diagnostic of fibromyalgia. So everybody goes looking for these points and often finds them and they, they, could, they give you numbers which, on which you can do research and so on. So these painful nodule points are often used by some people. But, and here they are superimposed on a diagram of the, the body's muscles, skeletal muscles. As I said before, I, I think that there's more to it than that. And actually, if you examine it with your fingers and thumbs, the long patient, the long muscles running up and down the back of the neck, I'm sorry about that, up and down here, running across the shoulders, the, this is the trapezius muscle, these are the levator scapulae muscles that lift the shoulder blades. And when we're tense, we tend to have our shoulders under our ears. And the, also the long muscles, very strong muscles that run up and down each side of our spine to keep us upright. They're very tight and very painful in fibromyalgia. And if you press on those or the long muscles of the legs or the gluteal muscles, the patient say, yes, 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 that's it. Nobody's ever done that before, but that's it. And I think it's these long muscles being tight that are so painful. Um, let's think a little bit more about causation, although we've heard quite a lot of it before. It really does seem that there may be genetic predispositions. There tend to be families of human beings who are more likely to get fibromyalgia. Maybe they're more likely to get the autoantibodies that uh, Dr. Russo spoke about. Um, and indeed, there are families of mice who also seem more prone to this sort of thing, including complex regional pain syndrome. So there may be genetic predispositions to getting fibromyalgia. And then in the environment, I'm thinking more, not so much about chemicals, but life events and life experiences and whether one's brought up in an, a stressful environment um, and adverse childhood events, which we can talk about a little bit more in, the, in a minute. But when I talk at length with my many of my fibromyalgia patients, they have had really very difficult, very unpleasant event when they're children. Often they don't remember them, um, but they, we can talk about them in helpful ways with our patients. So, there is likely neuropathophysiological change. The way that the central nervous system and perhaps the peripheral nerves work seems to change. And the central sensitization that we've heard, the, the whole neural processing system found in the spinal cord and in the brain becomes more wound up and excitable and sensitized. Um, and there may be a pro-inflammatory state. There may be increased inflammation levels, particularly in the central nervous system, which is becoming a more and more uh, common area of discussion. But even, if, for example, in, as a physical cause of psychiatric conditions, maybe the inf inflammation of the cells in the brain are to blame. 20 years ago, when, um, I'm sorry about that, let's just go back. Uh, a lot of patients were coming along saying, you must measure my stress hormone levels, my cortisol levels, my steroid levels, because they're probably um, wrong and you need to sort it out. Um, and so on and so on. Let's talk about that steroid thing. The, um, the pituitary gland, releases a substance which causes your adrenal glands, which sit just on top of your kidneys, to secrete cortisol into your blood. And this affects the metabolism of all sorts of activities in the body. And um, this is important for maintaining normal activities. And a sort of normal cortisol levels are pretty low during the night. And then they start to peak at about 6 a.m. or something to prepare you for waking up <laughs> and they and they do wake you up and uh, then they decline during the days and then you sort of tend to feel sleepy at night people who have to take steroid tablets so their levels are up here at night 
can't sleep very easily. So cortisol, cortisol is quite important for dealing with stress and infection and so on, but it's also important for programming your brain to do the right thing at the right time of day. And some people will have far too high cortisol levels and far, some people are too low. And so a lot of patients used to come and see us and maybe they still do saying, please measure my cortisol levels um, because they may be too high or too low. And in chronic, chronic stress, when you're totally burned out, the curve may be flat. You're just not secreting enough at all. And, and for other people, it's just too high. So cortisol may be um, imp uh, important. Um, infection, well, yes, maybe it generates, maybe as a side effect of infection, those autoantibodies are generated. But I believe it's mostly about the, uh, physical injuries and emotional events that uh, fibromyalgia is based on. So speaking as somebody who spent 20 years or more in an NHS, working in an NHS pain clinic, this is the Royal Free Hospital in London, um, what did we have to offer our patients with fibromyalgia? Well, we, we love to do things with machines and we love to block nerves and we love to do x-rays and things. And um, it's all great fun and very dramatic. I'm afraid that that sort of approach had nothing at all to offer our patients. And that was disappointing. So in the conventional pain setting, we then relied heavily on conventional medicines, which were used for pain, but were very often designed for something else. Uh, they were other people's uh, medicines. Um, and we thought, well, here is gabapentin, which is used to settle excitable nerves. Um, let's try that. Occasionally it helped, but for most patients, it really didn't help. It made them sleepy and it made them dependent on the drug. Um, and it made their memory worse. But very few people seem to be helped by gabapentin. But the problem was they never wanted to come off it again. So we'd made somebody more of a zombie than they felt already. That was dreadful. And then we tried morphine, which after all should stop all pain, shouldn't it? Unfortunately, it doesn't. Certainly not after about six weeks of still taking it, but you're hooked on it. It's very difficult to come off. And then we had the anti-inflammatories such as ibuprofen, which again, doesn't usually help very much and has a side effect on your stomach and your kidneys and all sorts of things. And we tried the older drugs such as um, amitriptyline, which again, did more to zombify our patients than anything else, but we could never get the patients off again. So that was pretty bad news. Um, so conventional medicines had very little to offer, unfortunately. Patients often did benefit from being given the diagnosis, you have fibromyalgia, it seems. Oh, thank you for telling me. At least they now know that they weren't being accused of being over anxious women, you know, as, as we heard earlier, or, you know, the blood tests are all normal, you must be putting it on. And they were very relieved to hear that that wasn't the case, they had fibromyalgia. And often the best we could do is simply re reduce some of those drugs to at least let them wake up and be the, a bit more themselves again. And then we really asked our colleagues in pain management, that the physiotherapists and the psychologists really to take these poor patients on and do the very best they could with graded exercise programs, relaxation techniques, cognitive behavioral therapy, moving on now to acceptance uh, therapy, um, acceptance and commitment therapy, ACT, which has proven to be very useful. Groups of people with similar conditions learning to manage their pain, get on with their lives as best as possible. Yoga therapy was often very helpful and other complementary therapies. And that was sort of the best we had to offer. We acknowledged that the brain and the mind and uh, the body and social interactions all interacted with each other to modify and modulate pain syndromes. And that was helpful for everybody, that your thoughts and your emotions could actually change the way your body worked. And, and if you could change your behavior and your thinking, you might be better off in a physical way. 
Um, if we begin to think about the neuronal changes, we're very used to the idea that if you damage a tissue, you know, if you bark your shin on a slide in the playground, as we all have as children, then we're used to the idea that the nerves will take this information into your spinal cord, which will then process the information and send the information up to the brain where the feeling of pain is, 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 is developed by your brain. But we're less used to the idea that the brain sends information downwards during the spinal cord to maybe, if we're lucky, inhibit the pain and turn the pain down. Or if we're feeling very anxious or depressed or whatever, it can turn the pain up. And that's why the psychological therapies can be so helpful. Turn the pain down, not up. If we think in more detail about this part of the spinal cord, we magnify it, we see hugely complex processing pathways, which are making all sorts of decisions about the feelings that are coming in, sensations that are coming in via electrical messages. And only as sort of edited highlights are sent up to the brain. And this is a, in effect an analog computer. And these nerves are talking to each other through releasing chemicals. And now um, we know from the work of uh, Professor Raphael Mahulam and now Dr. Russo, that these some of these messengers are the endocannabinoids, and sometimes they're not able to do their job enough, and we need to supplement them. Here's just a, a little reminder that these are the areas that get inflamed, maybe after injury, or maybe after stress, or maybe after infection. And um, um, uh, it's not the nerve cells, it's the ones that support the nerve cells that seem to get inflamed. And, uh, but, uh, and uh, as Andreas Goebbels, who we heard about before in Liverpool, is working on this inflammation here and in the brain. And we even know that where things happen in the brain can move across the surface of the brain according to pain states, injury, and so on. So this is not saying it's in your brain. This is not saying you are ima imagining it, dear patient, go and stop imagining you've got pain. This is real neuronal change in the brain that, um, that goes on in chronic pain states. This particular diagram is about phantom pain, but it's not a huge difference actually. So mood, life events and experiences and beliefs and expectations and society can all bring about long-standing neuronal change. So why am I talking to you now about sleep? Why is sleep important? Because I think it's very important. This is an amazing book, which everybody should read. Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, because we're supposed to spend a third of our lives doing this, but we don't know anything about it. We think we're just lying there with our eyes closed. But every 90 minutes when you're asleep, we go through these different stages of sleep. Um, initially, in the beginning of the night, we go through light sleep. We may not even realize we're asleep yet. And then we dip into uh, stage one of sleep and then stages three and four, where we alternate between being very deeply asleep and relaxed. And then we also experience periods of rapid eye movements, particularly more of that during the later part of the night. And it's very important your alarm clock doesn't go off there because you need to do lots and lots of dreaming to have a healthy mind and a healthy body. And um, we need to understand that to fall, it's very important to fall deeply asleep into stage three, which is slow wave sleep or deep sleep, and stage four of sleep when we dream. And this is because during deep sleep, our muscles deeply relax. Our pituitary gland secretes growth hormone, uh, which goes throughout our body and, and heals tissues that have maybe become damaged during the day. And also, as I said before, the supporting cells move away from our nerve cells in our brain so that toxins can be washed out of the nerve cells. Also, when we're deeply asleep, our short-term memories from the day before get transferred to the cortex of the brain for long-term storage. 
And also during dreaming or in rapid eye movement sleep, we process our emotions and we plan for the next day. That's why we're always slightly worried when we're sleeping because we're figuring out in a sort of a metaphorical way how to solve the problems for the next day. And if these cycles are messed up, for example, by those ruddy medicines that we keep prescribing, um, we may adversely affect stages three and four asleep. We may be asleep, but not um, physically or emotionally repaired. We may have unrefreshing sleep. And by the way, alcohol can certainly do that too. So if you will forgive me, and up against the challenge of trying to impress people who've already heard Dr. Russo speak, I'm going to come up with a sort of personal hypothesis that has occurred to me um, over the years with fibromyalgia, that long-term stress and adverse events, and perhaps also high stress hormones, affect the quality of our sleep. Maybe because we're hypervigilant, if something dreadful has happened to us in the past, we may never fall into deep sleep. We're always keeping an ear open for something that's about to happen. We may never leave very light sleep and may never fall properly into deep sleep stages three or four. And therefore, we never have our brain neurons cleansed. We never have our muscles relaxed and healed. And all sorts of things don't don't happen. We have unrefreshing sleep, um, our muscles hurt, we don't get that growth hormone spurt. We can't transfer our short-term memory to our long-term memory. We can't process our emotions properly and our nerves are still full of toxins. What does it mean? Unrefreshing sleep, chronic fatigue. You can't ever relax your muscles, widespread muscle pain. There's no growth hormone spurt to heal tissues, poor muscle and organ function, poor transfer of short-term memory to long-term memory, poor memory, brain fog, impaired emotional processing, anxiety and depression, impaired central nervous detoxification, cognitive impairment. Do these symptoms all added together into a syndrome, do they remind you of anything? Well, they seem to remind me of fibromyalgia. So I do feel quite strongly that missing deep sleep may be a strong causative factor in, in, in the genesis of fibromyalgia. As well as, <laughs> as well as, the unbalanced or the deficient endocannabinoid system. And I didn't just do this a little bit for today's lecture. I always say that, I always refer to Dr. Russo's work. So that's a lot of what I think is going on. Um, what do cannabis medicines have to offer? So rather than this picture, we got this picture and the chemicals that come from the little hair cells on the flowers of the plant. It's not a totally new idea. We're used to morphine coming from uh, the seeds of the poppy and aspirin coming from willow trees and all sorts of things. So these phyto, these plant chemicals have been used for a long time, but for some reason cannabinoids got a bad reputation. Um, here they are. These are the natural ones natural cannabinoids that we're, we think are deficient and we're trying to replace in the spinal cord, as we saw before, and in the brain. We're trying to increase the activity, the normalizing activity of the, and, uh, of the cannabinoid system in this analog computer of our nervous system. Well, how do conventional medicines and cannabis medicines com compare? Um, you know, to get gabapentin to work, you need to treat somewhere between four and seven patients to get any success. Our experience in our clinic with cannabis medicines is you only need to treat one and a half patients to get one success. It's a lot better, isn't it? Does the benefit wear off as, within, as with morphine? Actually, it doesn't seem to with cannabis. 
do you get dependency and addiction as you do with uh, morphine or gabapentin? Actually, we seem to get far less dependency, far less addiction. Do we stop you thinking clearly? Well, if we're getting it right, no, we don't. We think we can tweak the doses to get you better, but not zombified. You can't say that about conventional medicines always. Do we impair the memory? Well, we certainly hope not. Um, do we zombify people to coming just after Halloween? No, we don't. Do we constipate our patients? Usually not, morphine does. Do we feel fairly safe about people doing childcare, especially at night and driving? Well, we take great care, but we think patients are relatively safe if they're on the proper doses. Are they dangerous and overdose? Yes. Are they dangerous and overdose? Much safer. Is your sleep architecture affected by these? Yes. I would suggest that cannabis improves your sleep architecture and allows you to fall into deep sleep. Deep uh, sleep. Can the elderly tolerate these medicines? Usually not. Usually yes, if we're careful. So there's a lot going for cannabis medicines for these chronic conditions. We don't like to give them at all to people under 18 in our clinic. Um, um, and we try not to treat people under 25 because their nervous system is still developing, but sometimes we feel justified in doing this. We would almost never give it to women who are pregnant or breastfeeding or just about to conceive because it affects the developing brain of the child. And we're only treating long-term conditions. Now, this is dried cannabis flower and people inhale it through a vaporizer and it comes on, the effect comes on quickly and they like that. And it probably wears off two or three hours later. We do not wish our patients to eat cannabis and we do not wish them to smoke cannabis. And we think carefully about the ratio of the THC and the CBD and we try and get the right sort of ratio for each patient. And some people need different ratios. And sometimes we give them daytime flower sativa and nighttime flower indica to help with those diurnal rhythms that we were looking at before. I'm not very good at this, am I? And so with, it, with inhaled cannabinoids, you're getting a quick response that people like, but then it wears off. I'm sorry about this quickly. And then they want some more. These new pen vaporizers rather like um, tobacco uh, uh, vaporizers uh, are coming in. And I think in many ways they're better than flour because you're not breathing all that vegetation stuff. It, this is just cannabis oil. And we can dial up the sort of ratios that might be right for you. Um, and uh, so they might be better for you. And, um, and they may cost less than cannabis as well. But many of our patients who have not tried cannabis before will be given oils to put under their tongue and be absorbed that way. And um, we can again, we can dial up what's in there to suit that person and their experience and their whatever they found useful in the past. And um, we can also decide roughly how much of these other cannabis substances, the terpenes are in there, which um, often or quite helpful in energizing or soothing people or whatever. And there are the new capsules as well, which suit some people very well. Um, each of these routes of administration has a different curve and a longer curve, it's arguably a much better curve because you're not constantly having to top up. Once we're treating with uh, cannabis medicines, other things often get better. Migraine, people say, well, Yes, my pain's much better, and I don't seem to have a had a migraine recently. Their anxiety and depression are better. And, and one patient who we're treating for pain, his ADHD has got so much better that the studies he could never manage at school, maths and, and uh, English, he's now doing his GCSEs in, in his sort of early 30s, I think, because we've also helped this to settle. Um, a little bit about the literature, we've, we've heard uh, uh, some very interesting uh, research on various aspects, but when um, um, when the Cochrane Library, which does sort of reviews meta-analyses of 
what's out there in the literature. We're really looking around uh, at studies so far. I think it was a couple of years ago. They say we found no convincing unbiased high quality evidence suggesting that nebulone, uh, that semi-synthetic um, um, substance, cannabinoid substance, was any value of treating with people with fibromyalgia. And I think that's been a big problem. And I'll try and show you in a minute. The trouble is that the studies wanted to use legal substances, licensed substances, because it's much easier to do that. But the trouble is they're not, in my opinion, the real thing and therefore they're not so likely to help. Um, here um, is, is one uh, paper which really looked at that aspect that Dr. Russo was talking about, the alteration, the allodynia, that light touch is felt to be un, unpleasant, which is an indicator of impaired neural processing. And they, it's quite complicated, the findings, but they found that, um, essentially if they use the real thing, proper THC and CBD, that they often did abolish that abnormal finding that you sort of had to get the THC CBD ratio right, otherwise it didn't work. Um, I really like this, this paper. This was done in Brazil um, on a population of just 17 women with, I'm sorry, I promise to stop doing that, with fibromyalgia, they went into a very, very stressful um, uh, society where there was high incidence of violence in the city and very low socio uh, socioeconomical profile of their patients. And um, in Florianopolis, I wouldn't go there for a holiday actually, but it's a very good place to do research. And they did a very simple scoring system um, for in terms of the impact of fibromyalgia, the fibromyalgia impact questionnaire. Do you feel good? Do you feel pain? Are you fatigued? I can't remember what the other one is, but that's wrong. And using that scoring system, they found that in dividing the, their group into a treated group and a placebo group, um, the control group were largely unchanged. Okay, that's not surprising, except they felt less depressed afterwards maybe just because people had taken an interest. But there were significant um, improvements amongst the treated people in feeling good, feeling pain, doing work, that was the other one, and fatigue. So and they were using pretty raw sort of cannabis oil um, with predominantly THC and a small amount of CBD. Um, and starting off with, with one drop doses and just increasing. Most of the patients got a bit of sleepiness, a bit of dizziness, a bit of mouth dryness, things that we try and avoid with our patients. But they all got improvement with, um, um, uh, with, with pain and, and being able to work and getting on with their lives and so on. Their sleep also improved. And nobody actually wanted to stop the study because they felt bad actually generally felt better. So they concluded that plant-derived cannabinoids, phytocannabinoids, can be a low-cost and well-tolerated therapy to reduce symptoms in fibromyalgia and improve the quality of life. And we believe that to be true as well. Here's a study from Israel where, again, they were using real cannabis medicines. This time people were inhaling, I think maybe even smoking sometimes, but inhaling cannabinoids that have been chosen for that patient by their doctor. So using the real thing and titrated for each individual and look at the um, beneficial results that they got. Very few people had no change. Some had a slight improvement, but most of the patients had moderate or significant improvement. This is using real cannabis medicines, not just cannabis, but cannabis medicines. And here is a little study that we did. Um, Sophie ext very kindly extracted this information. Uh, here's a little bit about each patient you can see. And then we asked them about their pain, their mood and sleep, and any side effects. And so often we found pain was much improved, mood and sleep were improved, and there were no side effects on the whole. Um, we just studied 11 patients who happened to be female, we just took those who came along 
and there were two male, that, that usual preponderance of women troubled by chronic pain. And um, people had more energy, they were gardening again, <laughs> they were able to do physiotherapy, they were more confident, uh, better sleep. We heard this over and over again, and here are some more patients. Not everybody was helped, but predominantly people were. And look, I've only had one migraine in the last month. Previously, I had one every week. So most of our patients um, who were significant, uh, uh, of the nine patients we followed up so far, seven had improved. And one patient, although she didn't continue with her cannabis medicine, she worked in the NHS. And after a couple of weeks, she went to work. And her, pay, her, her, her colleagues in the NHS said, um, excuse me, why are you walking normally? And we found that uh, very interesting. So we're using the real thing, proper cannabis medicines, and we are personalizing those medicines to the patient, which is what we do. And um, so in my personal hypothesis that a lot of it's about sleep, um, I believe, but we need to find out, that we may well be restoring stages three and four. And I'm now asking all my patients, do you remember dreaming? Are you dreaming much? How does that compare with before? And um, I think we're reducing stress in their lives. I think we're relaxing their muscles through central nervous system effects. And I suspect that the cannabinoids and the terpenes are probably acting as an anti-inflammatory in the central nervous system. And I must go and talk to Andreas Goebel in Liverpool about that. Um, thank you very much for listening, if you still are. No, I think we have, absolutely are. Thank you so much, Dr. Orman. Thank you, that's really informative. We've had lots of comments about uh, a lot of the things you've said about sleep and pain and that relationship between fibromyalgia and sleep particularly. Um, so I just want to say that I think that we'll probably dive right into the question uh, section because we've had a lot of them. Um, so if you guys are happy with that, I'm just going to dive straight in. So um, I think well, I'm going to start with um, a lot of the questions have been regarding sort of the possible origins of fibromyalgia and that, um, how that is um, how that diagnosis sort of comes about. So for example, I've got, I'm gonna sort of start here with Dr. Russo and direct this question at you. Um, one question says, a recent study claimed fibromyalgia was an autoimmune condition. Uh, if, is that reliable or true? Well, again, um, this has been previously studied and the feeling has been that uh, they could not identify an autoimmune factor. Um, sometimes things are seen, but uh, this is an area of medicine that's fraught with difficulty. Uh, the same is true for lupus. People can have uh, seemingly abnormal tests without the disorder and vice versa. Um, as mentioned, we were looking for a specific type of autoantibody. Maybe we didn't find that, but we did see something else I really can't specify. And it's not that I'm holding out on you. It's we just don't have the answer yet. I think that the clinical picture of fibromyalgia so closely resembles that of other autoimmune disorders. Uh, again, we have from the lab now that there's some kind of transferable factor. Well, what else would it be besides uh, an autoantibody? Um, additionally, this female predominance is very characteristic of autoimmune disorders, um, including lupus, um, and uh, others, so uh, and rheumatoid arthritis in particular. So uh, the pattern really fits and we've just got to hone in on what the real culprit is. And then we should have better tests and then we won't have people trying to claim that this is a psychosomatic illness any longer. Um, I think, I'm I sorry, no. of course. Yeah. And, uh, Dr. Russo is mentioning um, similarities with rheumatoid. And when you listen to uh, rheumatologists talk about rheumatoid, they say that the thing that the patient complains about most is actually lack of energy. Uh, and where have we heard that before? Um, sure. So I'm, 
very interested to hear that. Yeah. I, again, there are overlaps in these diagnoses. Sometimes the separation isn't clear and people can have more than one. Uh, so it gets quite murky, um, right? I think that sort of actually your answers really helpfully lead into another one of the questions that was asked about this overlapping symptoms. Um, so, for example, uh, I had one uh, individual who said, you know, if it is, if it was an autoimmune disorder, um, I've been told I've got IBS, PTSD, osteoarthritis, fibromyalgia. Um, it, are they all linked in some way? Well, uh, again, they're all... Uh... There is some overlap, uh, certainly, and they're all things that have been linked to endocannabinoid dysfunction. They're all things where cannabis has been reported to benefit, uh, but to say that they're one disorder would be oversimplified and certainly not supported um, because a lot of these things do occur as discrete syndromes. And unfortunately, some of them accrue and multiply in certain individuals. And again, um, it's all too easy for the less sophisticated clinician to say that it's all in your mind, you know, um, and uh, really it's not. Um, and again, uh, particularly since as uh, Dr. Ordman's quite rightly pointed out, this often follows a history of tra trauma, whether physical or emotional, but uh, it creates this chicken and egg dichotomy that's very misleading uh, because it, it, it might make sense to a lot of people that if you're depressed long enough, you're going to hurt. But in fact, this all has a biochemical basis. Um, I am quite certain of that. We need to do a better job in demonstrating just what the problem is, however. No, I think that's true. And it's interesting what you just said as well. So I will, because I'm going to come back to that in terms of sort of cannabis and the relationship with multi-symptom management and that challenge for clinicians, because that actually is a question that's come later. Um, but for now, I just wanted to ask, there's a couple of questions that I just wanted to ask Dr. Aldman as well, specifically. So it was about, both of these are about how you differentiate between fibromyalgia symptoms and other diagnoses. Um, so the first one is, you know, I have CRPS and fibromyalgia. How am I defining, how am I distinguishing between which of those pains I am experiencing and how you might manage that? Fibromyalgia. So what we were looking at is, again, as old fashioned doctors, we're looking at the clinical picture in the patient. Um, usually complex regional pain syndrome will involve one limb or two limbs, uh, often on one side of the body. Whereas fibromyalgia tends to be widespread pain in a rather symmetrical pattern throughout the body. So it's good old fashioned medicine again. Um, what is the clinical picture? Uh, which um, when I was at medical school, you, you made the diagnosis from your clinical findings, from listening to the patient and examining them. Then you made your diagnosis. Then you did the tests to see if you were right or not. And I hold by that in pain medicine. So that's the major differentiator. But the, as, as Dr. Russo says, they do overlap in, in many ways. And do we think that, you know, this is just my question now, do we think that cannabis medicines could be applied in both those instances, for example, in that clinical picture where you've got both of those diagnoses? Yes, I mean, it, I, I've got quite a lot of experience with complex regional pain syndrome. And actually what, the best way to, to start treating that is to reintegrate the neural pathways, reintegrate the cortex of the brain with the spinal cord, with the limb itself. And what you need to find is a specialist physiotherapist who knows how to do that. Secondly, I will do some nerve blocks and give one or two um, conventional intravenous medicines if that's not enough. Um, because it works. I've developed that over 20 years. If a patient with CRPS said to me, could I try some cannabis medicines, please? I think I'd be delighted because as Andreas Goebbels, again, in, in Liverpool has pointed out, it's very, very likely there is inflammation in the central nervous system in both conditions. And um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't push uh, cannabis medicines alone for CRPS, but I think they might help. 
while you're trying to sort everything else out. No, I think that's really interesting. I think as well, I think that's something that we do talk about at the clinic, isn't it? About the idea that there is cannabis medicines for now. Um, obviously, Dr. Russo's work is sort of looking much more in depth into the idea of, of considering it as a treatment. But at the moment in the UK in particular, it's based on uh, symptom management and that we often encourage people to look at the underlying cause of their symptoms of pain and see if there are, if the cannabis medicines can support them in exploring that and how they engage in that, like physiotherapy and having that motivation, that fatigue management, really important, I think. Um, there's so the other question in terms of differentiation was um, fibromyalgia and perimenopausal symptoms, which is a very interesting one. <laughs> well, well, I'm just going to say, yeah, they, I think these are separate things that certainly yeah. can co-occur um, and will aggravate one another. Um, but yeah, um, one of the one of these is time limited, hopefully, but <laughs> um, not always. No, that is really helpful. I think that's it. I think that it's because of the history of fibromyalgia as a diagnosis, I think that idea of, you know, things like ME, this idea of widespread pain when a doctor says, where does it hurt? And the patient says everywhere, the challenge is then to sort of identify correctly what that actually means and what kind of pain that is that you're experiencing. So I think that's very, very true. And it's difficult for patients to identify themselves and separate and articulate what pain they are experiencing. Um, I think in for both of you now, I think it's sort of um, questions regarding all of these symptoms we've talked about, fatigue, uh, pain, sleep. Um, there's obviously lots of questions about recommendations of what kind of medications in terms of cannabis medicines might be appropriate for a fibromyalgia patient. Uh, I'd be happy to go ahead. Um, it's clear to me that uh, some THC is necessary. However, the amount that's required may be very low. Um, one thing that we certainly learned from the Sativex program is that you don't want the dose too high or too fast. Um, the adage that we use is start low and go slow. Um, I really favor very, very low amounts of THC, but there's got to be some. I don't think that we've seen clinical responses with CBD only. However, CBD is very helpful as an adjunct to THC, particularly lowering the side effect profile of THC and increasing its therapeutic index. Beyond that, for sleep, if someone knows the composition of their cannabis-based medicine, having some myrcene um, certainly um, will improve sleep. Um, and linalool, uh, which is one of the active ingredients in, um, in lavender, is excellent, um, both as an anti-anxiety agent and um, uh, can help with sleep, again, as an adjunct. And then again, uh, caryophylline, uh, which affects the CB2 receptor, but not the CB1 receptor, so it does not produce intoxication like THC. Uh, but it has a strong anti-inflammatory effect, this would be a useful adjunct. Finally, limonene, uh, which is in citrus, uh, producing the citrus odor, is a very noteworthy antidepressant. Um, so uh, I recognize that in the UK in particular, you don't necessarily have these kinds of choices. However, um, Certainly, we're trying to create a situation where people have more latitude in uh, choosing their medicine, and um, uh, hopefully we can come up with an ideal mix that uh, works nicely for most people. Well, I'm going to follow that excellent answer, if I may, um, Sophie, by totally agreeing that we do need some THC and we've broken the English, the British model in that, that we always have a bit of THC. So for you will know that we have one patient, one patient who we had to go backwards on and who got a marked anti-inflammatory, anti-pain effect with just CBD. She, her hands went from useless to knitting, but that was only one patient. Um, and we're also very fortunate in our clinic because of the pharmacy that 
work as our partners that we are very much into terpenes and we do try and dial up the right terpenes for the right person so we're not that far behind you i just i just say that <laughs> no I, I really didn't put it in those terms you know again so is the government <laughs> fault as i said earlier um so and again in the united states i live in an area where there are a lot of choices but in many areas that's not true at all um so but again we're making progress in this direction but i don't have a lot of hair left so <laughs> um I, I hope to live to see it no I, <laughs> um that's interesting because actually there is a very specifically um state as uh, so a state's question I, I imagine because they're talking about dispensaries so um the question was how does one find cannabis with cbd and thc it seems that the dispensaries in the east coast are selling high thc and thc strains of gmo hybrid fe female plants with hardly any cbd only high thc uh, possibly leading to thc neuropsychological toxicity uh does this is this we're talking about this in terms of relationship between this and psychosis and um so i'm interested in your answer on that yeah well here's the thing if someone is predisposed to psychosis uh thc may tip them over quick more quickly so if someone's predestined to have schizophrenia it will be unmasked earlier however it does not create this de novo. Uh, there was a study that was done in the UK and it was something like it would take 5,200 people not using cannabis to eliminate one case of schizophrenia. So um, it's true to say, if you've got it, you should be careful and possibly not use it at all. Um, but beyond that, um, uh, yeah, unfortunately in a situation like this, if only THC is available, one should just tread very lightly, uh, very, very lightly indeed. Um, uh, in depending on the state, again, uh, it's up to the consumer to ask for material that's more balanced, a type two cannabis with at least equal amounts of THC and CBD, or even CBD predominant, but again, with a little bit of THC. And when I say a little bit, a uh, milligram or two at a time may make a big difference. Um, and, uh, you know, some people do quite well with that, never escalate their dose and don't have psychoactive side effects that are a problem for them. So this is achievable. Um, for many patients, there's some sweet spot where their function is enhanced, not impaired uh, by using this kind of medicine. I think that's I think that's really interesting. I think one of the fine things we found is that idea of the fibromyalgia patients benefiting quite a lot from balanced products, I think very specifically. Um, so there is something about that relationship between um, THC and CBD and both of them being present in order to achieve that uh, comprehensive symptom management. Um, I just want to sort of a couple of final clinical questions that I want to sort of um, float. One of them was the rhetoric of start low, go slow. And this is a really interesting one to me because um, there we will often see patients who have been self-medicating with cannabis for sometimes decades and their tolerance will be very different to someone who's cannabis naive. Um, and so they're often clinically speaking, we are met with the challenge often where we are um, finding patients who've used, for, who've used cannabis for a long time successfully coming to the legal system and starting at CB, like CBD only and increasing THC very slowly and they lose faith in it very quickly as a, as a, a medicine because it's not as effective as what they've dealt what they've previously dealt with. And I'm just interested in both of your thoughts on this idea of this standard rhetoric, because we love policies and rhetoric in medicine where we say, these are the rules, this is how, you, this is how it works. Um, so I'm interested in your thoughts on that, go low, start low, go slow. I'll let uh, Anthony go first on this one. <laughs> oh, I'm happy um, to answer. I, I, I entirely go along with Sophie's assertion that your starting point is listening to the patient's experience of cannabinoids. And if they've come to you smoking joints and they're trying to legalize the situation, they are probably getting about 26% THC in what they're inhaling. And if you say, well, I'm just going to give you CBD for a little while, they'll, they'll 
run a mile because it's useless. You have to pitch in where they're coming from. Not always quite as high, but you must pitch in at that level. But for the cannabinoid naive patient, you must, must, in my opinion, give them plenty of CBD to modify the effect of THC. But I agree with you, Dr. Russo, you must also give them a little bit of THC because that's largely what works. And as we've just heard, that you have to engage your patient. You've only got one go to engage your patient and save them either from Ill 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 illegality or from morphine and gabapentin, because we are actually saving people from those fates. I, I sincerely believe that. And so you must give them a bit of THC to, to get a positive result first time, otherwise they will go away. And that's no here, here. One thing to add, and that is uh, for the person that's already smoking spliffs or, or the like and has fibromyalgia or anything else that you're treating medically, um, my colleague Dustin Sulak has uh, an interesting approach to this. He calls a resensitization procedure. Um, and in this, he has them quit all uh, THC for 48 hours, that's all, and then resume at half the prior dose and finds that pain control and symptom control is as good as it was on what they were using before. So immediately you've cut it in half as well as their cost. Um, so uh, this is quite advisable in that situation and may really allow somebody to get more bang for the pound, as it were. That's really interesting to hear. Um, does that maybe also suggest that unlike morphine or something, you're not going to get withdrawal symptoms by suddenly stopping for a day or two? Sure. And uh, those would be mild at worst um, anyway. But uh, what's happening here is uh, you're reducing the tolerance. You're allowing a reset of the activity of the CB1 receptor in the brain. And um, normally we would think it would take a lot longer, but he has the success after just 48 hours of abstinence. Uh, so it's a big ask, but, uh, you know, again, it's not forever. No, thank you. They're really good answers. I think that um, the final question I have regarding sort of cannabis medicines, we'll sort of talk about this in the next, uh, in part two of this webinar a little bit more, because I think there's lots of people who are interested in the idea of CBD and the, how, the impact that CBD can have on uh, fibromyalgia symptoms. Um, but what I do want to touch on clinically is this idea of multi-symptom management through cannabis. And I think that a lot of doctors uh, and nurses and uh, healthcare professionals alike sort of have a real struggle with this idea of being able to prescribe one medication that manages lots of different symptoms. Um, and I would, my question is sort of how do you think that you can teach doctors how to manage that? Well, first they've got the lesson. <laughs> um, but uh, in that regard, if people want to send um, their uh, doctors uh, to my website, ethanrusso.org, there's a library tab there, and basically all my writings are available. So I've done my best over the last 25 years uh, to address a lot of different subjects related to cannabis and the endocannabinoid system. And um, that's all free. Um, and uh, uh, that's one way. Um, doctors hate to have a patient come in and say, here, read this. You know, as if they're not harried enough, um, trying to make their NHS quota and get on to their private patients. Um, but anyway, <laughs> enough cynicism. Okay, we're not upset at all. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> at least you didn't say anything about the golf course. So that's good. <laughs> but, um, and I agree with Dr. Russo, apart from that bit. Um, um, that doctors have to listen. But in my experience, you have to listen to your patients because this idea that, oh, I haven't had migraine recently and, oh, I can do my maths and English now um, is not a wonderful answer to your question about treating multiple problems. And you could argue that maybe, next, you know, ADHD is a, is a cannabinoid deficiency and maybe migraine is, probably is. 
And um, so if you listen to your patients who you're treating for one condition, you'll, you'll learn what else. And that's how I've learned, quite frankly, is listening to them. Brilliant, brilliant answers. And I think that's it. Just it's the key to any good clinical practice, whether it's cannabis medicine or not, is listening. I think active listening is a key part of that. Um, so I just want to say um, it's been really brilliant questions, really interesting discussion. So um, if I didn't get to ask any of your questions that you asked before, I'm really sorry. We just ran out of time. Um, I'm going to bring this session to a close by asking both panelists um, for sort of a statement on what they would like the takeaway, their takeaway for the audience from this webinar to be, if Dr. Russo would like to start. Uh, well, you know, what the world needs now is the ability to do uh, genuine randomized controlled trials unencumbered with cannabis-based medicines. And this has uh, been the story of the last 25 years for me. Um, we still have tremendous roadblocks to research in my country and hopefully less in yours. But if I had had my brother's uh, 15 years ago, we would have been looking at Sativex uh, trials in fibromyalgia. Uh, so hopefully this can still occur. Um, and maybe we can even do better uh, than that with uh, a really dedicated uh, cannabis-based medicine. Yeah. My response would be that if you're seeking treatment for your condition, it's probably best not to be using cannabis that you buy from somebody you met at the pub. You don't know what's in there. And there's probably a whole load of weed killer and ghastly things which you're inhaling. That you're much better seeing somebody who can tune the medicine to you as a person, as well as your condition. And that you probably need somebody who knows about terpenes and how to get them into you in the right proportions. And that and talking to people who who collate the research, like um, the gatekeepers to what's available on the NHS, the studies that are based on synthetic substances or one substance are of no value. They don't work, as, as I've tried to show today. You need proper cannabis medicines. Um, they'll do the job if you've got somebody who knows how to use them and good luck. Thank you very much. And I think on that note, I just want to say thank you to everyone. And um, we hope you found the talk very interesting. I certainly did. Um, if you'd like to find out more about cannabis medicines or whether they can help you, then do get in touch with the team at Integro either by phone or by completing the contact form online at www.integroclinics.com. And as I mentioned at the beginning, I know that a lot of people have been asking um, their further details, details of all the collaborating organizations will be in an email sent out to all attendees after the webinar finishes. Um, this event has also been recorded, so it will be available on all participating organizations' websites very soon, and you will be able to watch it again and share it with whoever you think might find it useful. Um, and just a reminder that part two of the Cannabis Medicines of Fibromyalgia event will be next Tuesday, 9th of November, 7 p.m. UK time, where we will hear from patients Stephen Spencer, Maz Mills, and Anne-Marie Bard, as well as GP and founder of Primary Care Cannabis Network, Dr. Leon Barron, author of the CBD book and the chief editor of CPAS, Mary Biles, and Dr. Ordman, who, who will be returning again to speak uh, for a roundtable discussion on the lived experience of those living with conditions such as fibromyalgia, and arthritis and how cannabis medicines have been included into their care regimes. So the link to register this event will be in an email at the end of this session and will be on Integro Clinic social media channels everywhere. Another final thank you to our panelists for presenting and educating us this evening and thank you to everyone attended and got involved in the chat. Please keep an eye out for the recording and the link for the next uh, event which will come available soon. Thank you so very much, Dr. Ethan Russo and Dr. Anthony Orden for joining us. It's been a real pleasure and a real learning experience. Thank you very much. Our pleasure. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye.